It's good to see everyone, every single one of you this morning. Thank you for coming here and, and being together to worship uh, our God and, and praise Him as we just sang about. A lot of exciting things going on, started with the beginning of the year. Uh, we talked about last Wednesday, if you were here for that, there were uh, teen college weekend studies coming up on February 9th and 10th. We're going to go over Joshua and his life and how he represents Jesus. That's coming up and that's exciting. Um, and as well, as I said, over the summer, that we would start our boys' class soon after our teen weekend study. And a lot of you that were parents that were bringing your kids to the boys' class in the back, the young men's training class, and we were doing a lot of scripture reading, we were doing some preaching, we were doing some singing, uh, asked me if we would do it in the spring instead of in the summer, because uh, several of all said that would be easier. So I agree. Uh, so please don't make me regret doing that. <laughs> uh, it wasn't my decision, it was a lot of yours. So I'm excited about that. So if you're a young guy... Uh, and you preached last time, you sang last time, be looking up on the board by next week because I'm going to post the new list about what day you're going and when you're going to speak. If you didn't get to speak last time and you want to, I told you I'd get you something to do if you could read. If you can read, I can do something with you. Then come and talk to me or get your mom or your dad to come and talk to me and I'll sign you up on the new sheet. Uh, so do that today if you can or Wednesday, but that'll be exciting and I'm sure we'll all enjoy that, those that participate in that. Uh, what I want to do this morning is talk to us that are actually already Christians, maybe been Christians for a while, but this sermon is about baptism. But it's going to be to those that have already been baptized for a while. Uh, several in this congregation uh, have, and I'm only going to say this phrase once, in the past four years that I've been here, have been baptized again. And I hate that phrase because there's only one baptism. And there's only one baptism for remission of sins. And you do it once in your life, and that's it. So instead of saying being baptized again, I'm going to say throughout this sermon, go to the water twice. That you ended up going water twice. A lot of people have said this to me when they talk to me about it. If they call me late at night, which usually in the beginning, say, hey, I want to get baptized again. Eventually they start using this phrase, and I really like this. They say, I want to be baptized for real this time. That I am now in the state that I need to actually be in to put on Christ in baptism. And when I did, I went to the water, when I went to the baptistry the first time, I don't believe I was ready and I didn't do it for real. Or maybe they'll say I did it for the wrong reasons. I hear this a lot. Now, of us that have done this, I don't consider you to be baptized twice. I just consider you to be baptized. And I leave it at that, and I'm happy about it, I'm excited about it. I just say, okay, those were baptisms that we had the past four years that this has happened. I don't try to qualify them in any way. But I am going to for this particular sermon because I did feel like it was necessary to maybe talk about this since this has happened so often. That someone's gone to the water twice, but this time they've done it again for real this time. The reason why I want to bring it up is because every time that I've been in that situation where someone called me and said, I want to be baptized for real this time, we would have a conversation before that happened. And I in no way try to talk them out of it. That wasn't my goal But I did try to have a conversation enough where there wasn't going to be a third time. That, you know, at this point right now, we both know and we both agree, you know enough and your understanding is enough that you're going to be baptized. A lot of y'all that have come talk to me that are younger, that usually under 15, 16, you come to me and you want to talk about being baptized, we've had the same conversation too. That we've gone over the same things that right now we understand that we know enough about God, we know enough about our own sin, we know enough about repentance, that right now we know what we're doing. And we're going to look back on this moment and you're going to say, you know what, I was baptized for the right reasons, I did it for real that time. So several of y'all in this room have heard this conversation before, but instead I put it into the form of a sermon. I remember being maybe 17 years old, and a lot of my friends that I grew up with were getting baptized again, or like I like to say, going to the water again. And I remember thinking back on that and thinking constantly for a long time. I was sitting there going, do I too need to go back to the water a second time? Do I need to do it for real this time? Because all of my other peers were doing it. And, and evaluating myself, and I asked for help, which was a great thing for me to do. And I decided, that, no, I had not done that. I had grown. I had grown enough. Things were more important to me. My salvation was more serious to me. That I had just grown and I didn't need to do that a second time. Uh, So let's kind of evaluate this in a biblical way and look at some Bible passages we all have read, but look at from the perspective of what we're doing here. I have four points about doing it for real this time. We're going to talk about first, did you do it by the pattern? Looking back, I'm going to ask, did you do it with faith? I'm going to ask, did you do it with conviction? And finally, I'm going to say, were you baptized with repentance? 
And if you can say all of those things, yes, I was baptized according to the pattern, with faith, with conviction, with repentance, I'm going to say, you know, you're great to go. You know, that was for real. And you can take some real confidence in that. Uh, And then at the end, I want to talk about growing and say, well, have we just grown significantly? And if we have just grown significantly, I'm going to say, well, congratulations, you did exactly what God told you to do. Right? And so that's going to be kind of our outline. Now, before I get into this, let me, let me say something to be real clear. Very clear, all right? The Lord's going to have heard me say this. YouTube's going to have a record of it. And you're going to also be my witnesses that I said this. If you want to be baptized, I am not going to stop you. All right? Because I don't want y'all coming up to me after this and saying, Andrew, you hindered people from being baptized today because of what you said. I'm not. If you want to be baptized, regardless of how many trips you've made to the baptistry, Let's have a little conversation, but I will baptize you if you feel like that's what needs to be done. All right? I will baptize you in the name of Jesus for the mission of your sins. So please, this is not a hindrance at all. This sermon is only for those that may have been thinking about this, may have some doubts about this, to either reassure or help us come to a better understanding. All right? That is the sole purpose of this sermon. So, I will baptize you. All right? Or, you know, somebody else can if you'd like them to. I don't care if I have to do it. But there's no hindrances here. Let's first read Acts 19. And I had this on the screen. In Acts 19, we see this happening in the book of Acts. That someone went to the water again. And this was these 12 men we meet in Ephesus. In Acts 19, we see at the end of 18 that Apollos has left Ephesus. And he has gone on. Excuse me, he's left Corinth and he's gone on to Ephesus. He meets Aquila and Priscilla. But he only knew the baptism of John. So Aquila and Priscilla teach him a little better. In the meantime, Paul goes to Corinth where Apollos just left. And he meets some people that probably Apollos had converted and not had given them the whole story. So let's read verse 1 of chapter 19. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, We have not so much have heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he came to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with baptism of repentance, saying to people that they should believe on him who would come after them, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. So here as Apollos goes to Corinth and Paul goes to Ephesus, if I finally say that right, he finds these disciples. And Paul goes and asks them the question, uh, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And I can understand there would be two possible things that Paul means there in context. One, he was saying, did you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which we understand to be salvation, eternal life? Or he was asking, did you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, which he's going to give him at the end of this section? But regardless of what Paul meant, it didn't matter, because what was the Ephesians' reply? We don't even know if there is a Holy Spirit. I I don't even know what you're talking about. And so because they don't even understand what the Holy Spirit is, don't even know if there is a Holy Spirit, he's like, oh, okay, all right, let's talk about this. And they reveal that they were baptized into John's baptism, a baptism that was about repentance, a baptism about what the one who was to come. And Paul's answer in verse 4 is wonderful. You know, does he shame these people or slam them down because they don't understand? Does he go, what in the world? You don't believe in the Holy Spirit? Like, that's not what he goes here, does he? Instead, he just says, okay, well, you're doing something right. You, you know about John. You know about repentance. That's great. But John's whole thing was to get you to Christ Jesus. And so there must have been more of a conversation here. And at the end, we see here that these men were baptized in the name of Jesus this time. They went to the water twice. But this last time is when they were baptized in the name of Jesus for their mission of their sins. And we'll bring this Acts 19 up several times as we go through here. First, let me do this one. And this wasn't one to be one of my primary ones, but I knew it would be brought up. Were you baptized like the pattern? If we have those memories of being baptized. Were we baptized like the pattern we see in the New Testament? And of course what I'm talking about is immersion for the remission of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. That was the pattern that was laid out for us. The reason why we do this and we have to have this conversation is because there is so many people out there telling people that they're baptizing them and they're not doing anything like the pattern. 
right? We have pouring. You can get sprinkled. Or even the concept of remission of sins. You have the idea, okay, you're, we're going to baptize you, but this isn't what's saving you. You're, you're not receiving remission of sins at this moment. You're, you're just doing an outward expression of something that's already happened days ago, right? And so there's all these different ways we can do it. And what we have to understand is unless we did it by the New Testament pattern, then we didn't do it the way God wanted us to. And if we didn't do it the way God wanted us to, we're, we're in trouble, right? We see this pattern concept being brought up several times in the New Testament. And this point right here could be a sermon, but I just need to do like a summary of this. So in Philippians 3.17, Paul says, Brethren, join in my following, my example, and note those who so walk as you have for a pattern. Right? That the New Testament Christians, they had a pattern. They had a way of doing things guided by the apostles who was guided by the Holy Spirit, guided by God themselves, right? They, the way they did things is the way we want to imitate. He says the same thing to Timothy. 2 Timothy 1.13, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Right? Here's a pattern. It was given to us by Jesus. Timothy, I need you to follow that pattern. Copy that pattern. Be like the original group that the Holy Spirit set up for us to imitate. And so we think about the patterns in that sense. Well, how were they baptized in the New Testament? How did that work? Well, we're going to read some of these passages later on, but they were immersed for the remission or forgiveness of their sins, right? That's the way the pattern worked out. There's countless examples. The eunuch, he went down into the water in Acts 8, 38. When Jesus was baptized, he was immersed as an example. If you look at Mark 1.10, of course here Jesus not being baptized in the name of Jesus, but here in John's baptism, John baptizing him. But he did so for us as have an example. In Mark 1.10 it says, Immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. This is when God says, You are my beloved Son. Right? Well, here he says that Jesus came up from the water, or coming up from the water. What do you got to do first to come up from the water? You got to go down in the water, right? That's how it works. You go down, and then you go up, right? You can't come up from the water if it was done in a different way. So even Jesus was baptized through immersion by John in a different setting. As well, Paul says that baptism is a burial with Christ in Romans 6, 3 through 7. Actually, a passage about repentance. And yet, these are countless examples of the way it was done, right? They immerse people in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Countless examples. And so, if you were not baptized in the manner, in the pattern that the New Testament did it, the people in the New Testament did it, then I would want to have a conversation about going to the water again, Right? What's even more interesting about this is actually history attests that this is the way the first century Christians baptized. We actually know when we started pouring and sprinkling. We actually know when we started doing it. It was in the 13th century. You had people that were sick, maybe people that were elderly. They didn't want to get baptized. So they're like, well, maybe I can just pour some water on you and that'll count. So they started trying to compensate and make things more convenient for people. Eventually, in the 14th century, it was like, well, why not just do that for everybody? It's a lot easier. So we actually know when we started, man started getting away from the pattern. If you didn't do the pattern, well, let's have a conversation about that. And let's see if we can make sure that we are baptized for real this time. Now I'm going to get into the ones I actually really want to talk about. When you think back on your baptism, were you baptized with faith? This is extremely important. Were you baptized with faith? Did you believe in the Holy Spirit? Right? Did you believe that there was a Holy Spirit? And he was there, right? And he serves a part of the salvation process. Can you guess what the next one's going to be? <laughs> Did you believe in God? Did you believe that he was there? Mark 16, 16 is the most popular passage we use. And when we read this passage, we actually focus on baptism. But I want to focus on the believing part. Hebrews 16, 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned, right? As well, if we turn back to John chapter 3. In John 3, when Nicodemus sneaks out, basically, to go talk to Jesus, he was a Pharisee, and he knows that Jesus is a good teacher. He knows he's from God, and he wanted him to ask some questions. Jesus says this to him in John 3, 18, 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. 
Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Right? So he says, if you believe, you're going to be all right. You're on the right track here. But if you don't believe, you're condemned already. You're already condemned, right? And until that changes, Jesus says, I can't do anything for you. I can't work with you here. What would be the next one if we say, do you believe in Holy Spirit? Do you believe in God? We just read in John 3.18. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God when you were baptized? Did you believe that he is who he said he was? I don't know why I have Acts 9 up there, because that's Paul's conversion. But look at Acts 8. Acts 8. Here, when the Ethiopian eunuch sees water, he asks, you know, Philip, you know, are there any conditions? You know, is there anything hindering me from going ahead and being baptized? And this is Philip's answer in verse 37 of Acts 8. Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. What was the condition there? Well, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Well, if yes, then yeah. That was for real, because you were baptized with faith. I think this is a kicker here, this next point. Not only did you believe these individuals were real and they were who they said they were, but did you believe that he has the power to save us from sin? Isn't that important in this process? You know, it's one thing to believe God is real. It's another thing to believe that God can do the things he said he can that God's promises were real, that he says, if you believe and you're baptized, you will be saved. That's a promise, right? And did you believe that he actually could do it? And if you did, I think that was absolutely for real. To give another verse here, Hebrews eleven twenty nine 29 uses the Red Sea as an example. We learn in 1 Corinthians 10 that the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea, was a shadow of baptism uh, that was to come. It says, by faith, the Israelites, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. Whereas the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned, right? Why were the Israelites able to be saved by the way of the Red Sea? Hebrews 11 says it's because they had faith. But the Egyptians, they tried to cross the Red Sea without faith, and they were condemned. They drowned. For baptism to work, for it to be real, for it to be valid, you have to have faith. Right? Faith is what saves us with baptism. We learn that from Ephesians 2. It is faith that's important here. Let's move to our second one. Were you baptized with conviction? Not just faith, but also with conviction. Conviction is a belief. But often when we use our context in the Bible, it's usually belief that we are guilty of something. That usually here, we are convicted. We believe that we have sin. And that sin condemns us. Let's look at John 16, 8. John 16, 8. We see here that it is the Holy Spirit's job to convict us. And obviously he's done that through the work of the apostles, through the work of creating the word for us to have in our own hands. This is what the Holy Spirit's job does. He convicts us of our sin. John 16, 8, Jesus talking to the disciples, starting in verse 5. Starting in verse 5 there. It says, But now I go away to him who sent me, And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and see you no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. What's interesting about this passage, not only is he going to convict us of sin, but also of judgment and of righteousness. So that we understand that, okay, this right here is my sinful state. And I'm going to be judged and condemned because I'm convicted of my sin. I believe that there's sin in here. But also, I'm convicted of righteousness. That righteousness is in God, and God is giving me the opportunity to join Him in righteousness through forgiveness of sins. Right? Did you believe that? Did you understand that? As well, were you convicted uh, because of the Word of God? Right? Paul said this was the main goals of teaching God's Word in 1 Corinthians 14, 24. 
talking about those of what we do in our assembly. He says, but if all prophesy, an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. That he would be convicted of those three things, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. As well, in John 8, hopefully you're still there, if you look at John 8, conviction is one of our motivations to act or to do. And hopefully conviction was at least one of our motivations to be baptized. I know the PowerPoint's all kind of funny. I, I did actually work really hard on it. I did not throw this together. I think my thought was different. And then it changed it when I put it on the, the older version up here. Uh, but here in John 8, this is what Jesus says. We have the Pharisees come and they bring this woman who was caught in adultery. And they want Jesus to do something about it. And they throw her on the ground before him and they say, this woman should be stoned, right? And here in verse 8, this is Jesus working with this. After he, they say, you know, we should throw a stone. Let's start in verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Basically making the point, okay, you want to stone her because you caught her in sin. Well, of y'all that don't have any sin, you'd be the first one to throw the stone, right? And this is their reaction. Verse 8 says that he again stooped down and wrote in the ground. Now when they heard it, because they were convicted by their conscience, went out one by one. Beginning with the oldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in his midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are the accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Verse here, not about baptism, but definitely Jesus saving a life, right? He says that when he tells this thing to these guys, he says, You know, you are without sin, you throw the first son. It says that their conscience convicted them. And when they were convicted by their conscience, what did they do? They left. Because conviction is supposed to be a motivation. That's the way it works. You're convicted of sin, you're going to want to repent. You're convicted of sin, you're going to want to be baptized. You're convicted of sin, you're going to want to pursue God, right? And this is what they do. They try to change, even these awful people that still aren't getting it, still try to make some kind of change because they're convicted of their conscience. Hopefully us, we're convicted by our sins. We're being baptized, right? Now, what I said here, as you notice, I said, was this one of your motivations? Was it one of your motivations? I didn't have to say it was the motivation, but hopefully it was extremely important. <laughs> when you ask people, and we have this conversation, you know, the question gets asked, well, why were you baptized? And you'll get a lot of different answers. Hopefully this is one of them. Well, I was in sin, I knew I was in sin, and I knew Jesus could save me from that sin, right? Hopefully that's got to be there. It's got to be there. Now, understand, when you think about maybe emotional motivations or what gave you the courage to go ahead and take that step, I understand that could be different, right? You know, someone maybe have lost a loved one and said, well, you know, so-and-so passed away. I was thinking about them. I was thinking how I want to be with them. Well, I knew that I was in sin. I couldn't be with them, so I, I went ahead and I was baptized. I think that's fine. Right? I think that's actually okay because you were still convicted of sin. There may have been another emotional factor in there that helped, Right? Uh, In Titus, God says that it was the kindness. Paul says it was the kindness of God that motivated us to change, to to become Christians, right? You think about God's kindness, all the good he's done for us. You think, okay, you know what? I'm in sin, and I can't be part of God's kindness until I take care of that sin. Well, how do I take care of that sin? Well, I'm baptized in Jesus Christ, right? That, too, there's conviction in there, even though there may have been some other things. But again here, most importantly, was their faith, was their conviction. And finally here, Were you baptized with repentance? Because this is a a clarifying thing as we see through Acts. Of course, we know this verse. When Peter is there in Acts chapter 2, in verse 38, they're cut to the heart. They're convicted of their sin, right? They say, what do we do? And Peter says, well, you need to repent and be baptized for the remission of sin, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Later, when he's at Solomon's portico, you know, he asks him, like, you know, what do we do? He says, well, you need to repent and be converted, right? Repentance is there at the same time. At Mark 1, when Jesus gives his thesis statement, they're like, why are you here? And Jesus is like, I'm here for you to repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. Repentance is the key factor here and before we get baptized. Now, let me say this. Repentance alone, does that grant us the gift of salvation? 
It doesn't. And you think about mainstream Christianity, maybe where a lot of us came from before we were here. What were you taught? Probably a lot of us actually were taught that repentance grants salvation. That's a popular belief now. But Acts 19, the very first passage we read, explains that repentance alone isn't it. There's repentance and a baptism into Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. However, repentance is extremely important. Repentance is that decision that we're going to turn from our old ways, my ways, and now I'm going to pursue God in his righteousness, right? I'm going to make changes in my life to fit closer to the pattern that's been laid out for me. That's what repentance is. Sometimes when we look back on our baptism, we realize that we repented like Paul, meaning that we had a big changes to make in our life. Some of us were like that. If you look in Acts 9, Hopefully you keep on turning with me, and I've shown you a lot of Acts today. Of course, when we do a sermon about salvation, this is usually the book we end up going to. In Acts 9, now in verse 13, after Jesus appearing to him in the road to Damascus, he has this conversation with Ananias. He comes to Ananias, Jesus, and says, I want you to go find Saul. This is where he's at. I want you to teach him the gospel. Verse 13, Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard much or heard from many about this man. How much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine, to bear my name for for Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. For I will show him how much many things he must suffer for my name's sake. It's almost kind of comical that Ananias feels like he needs to remind God about how bad Paul used to be. How Saul used to be. So, (laughs) Lord, do you know Saul? (laughs) Because I've heard stories, right? And, of course, Jesus even has a higher purpose for Saul. You know, he says, no, I, he's going to bear my name before kings, before the children of Israel. And I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my sake. But Saul had a lot to repent of, didn't he? And some of us in this room, we look back on our life and say, you know what? Before I was baptized, I had a lot to repent of. There was a lot of changes I had to make in my life. A lot of different decisions. I go, you know, this is in my life. This is wrong. I need to pursue Jesus. This in my life. This is wrong. I need to pursue Jesus. We had a lot of decisions to make at that moment. Now, other hand, it's still repentance, but sometimes people had to repent like Cornelius when they get baptized. And what I mean by that is actually in the grand scheme of things and the way that we raid our sin, which is wrong, but we think about more like Cornelius, there's actually may have not been a dramatic amount of sins that we had to repent of. Look at Cornelius' life and just flip over to Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 1, It says, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what had been called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all of his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. We keep on reading the story. An angel appears for him, tells him to go get Peter. Peter's going to teach you something you need to know. He goes to all these great lengths to go get Peter, to bring Peter him. He brings all of his family and friends to hear what Peter has to say that God wants them to know about. And in verse 33, it says, So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded to you by God. That's Cornelius' answer to Peter. He says, Peter, we've all gotten here because we want to hear what God has commanded us to do. And we're excited. Please let us know. So as Peter's teaching, the Holy Spirit falls on them. The Holy Spirit you know, guarantees that, hey, all nations here, even the Gentiles are allowed to participate in the gospel. And then at the end of verse 48, Peter says, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. But here in Cornelius' life, were there big, massive changes that Cornelius had to make? There's probably some, but I don't really see any big, massive repentance changes that Cornelius has to make before he's baptized. Cornelius has actually been living very righteously, and it seems to be the majority of his life as far as we know. And yet, he still has to be baptized because he still hasn't received the forgiveness of sins, right? So repentance had already been a life that he had already been living. The reason why I give these two examples is because of us that have to go to the water twice, Usually we all have the same background growing up. Most of us were raised by Christian parents. Of us that have had to go to the water twice. And what happens is, is we get baptized, you know, usually very young. And then we grow up. We learn more about life. We learn more about sin. 
We learn about what our potentials are for righteousness and for evil. And we look back on our baptism and go, I want to go to the water again for real this time, right? Of course, if anyone feels that way, what I want us to do is say, okay, you know what? I feel like that. Was Last time, was I baptized with faith? Was I baptized with conviction? Was I baptized with repentance? And usually when we get to repentance is where we start thinking about it, which is good. I think that's a good place to stop and start thinking about it. However, just because you didn't have to repent of some massive ordeal in your life doesn't necessarily mean that your baptism wasn't for real. Just because we get older and we learn more about different types of sins, maybe we even explore those sins, but we come back to God with repentance and asking for forgiveness, that doesn't necessarily mean that our previous sins when we were younger weren't worth getting forgiveness for. When I look back on my life, and I, I was baptized relatively young, I remember the sins I was convicted of when I was baptized, the sins that I needed to repent of. Those sins were lying. I remember that. I remember that I was a liar. I remember like a year later after I got baptized, my mom caught me in a lie. And she said, aren't you a Christian now? Made me feel like this big. I had to repent again then, didn't I? But even though it was maybe, as we call it, just lying, that was still a sin I needed to repent of. Still a sin that I needed forgiveness of. There was a young brother that was talking to me about repentance, and he said that Andrew... I curse at school. I use bad language. My parents don't know. I've quit doing that. I've repented of that. But God has not forgiven me of that because I'm not a Christian. I think, you know, that guy, he wasn't going out murdering Christians. He wasn't committing adultery. He wasn't doing all these other things. But you know what? He did use bad language, and he was convicted of that sin. In my mind, that's repentance. You know, if that's the things you can remember of those memories, you did repent. Right? And you've made a dedication. I'm going to live the rest of my life to God. When I had this conversation with young people, and some of y'all in here are those young people that I've had those conversations with, we spent a long time talking about repentance, right? And what that means is we're going to now dedicate our life to God. And those little things, even if we can send them little, which they're not, lying, using bad language, disobeying our parents, those are sins we have to repent of, right? They are. Now, again, we can be at such a young age where, you know, we know we need to do better, but maybe we don't really understand the gravity. And that's when I go back to conviction instead of going to repentance. So we're really convicted of our sins. But just because your sins weren't big and bad in our earthly minds doesn't mean that your sins weren't good enough or or worse enough that you actually needed forgiveness. And that's the point I want to make here. Because the older we get, the more we learn about how bad sin really is. And then we start thinking and second-guessing our first repentance. If there's anyone that has any more questions about that, please come and talk to me more after. But I do not think that we have a list of sins here that are worthy of repenting of and a list of sins here that aren't really sins. They're just kind of like baby sins. we got to grow out of those. I don't do that. They're both sins. They both need to be repented of, and we both have to seek God's forgiveness of. So we kind of wrap this section up. Did you have faith? Did you have repentance? Did you have conviction? Those are some important things we need to think about when we think about our baptism. Let's finish this up quickly. The other example, have you grown? Do you need to be baptized again, go to the water again, or have you grown tremendously? Do you have a better understanding of salvation than you did when you were first baptized? Hopefully you do. Hopefully you appreciate it a lot more. Do you have a better understanding of God and his word? Hopefully you do. That's what you've been commanded to do. Have you fallen to sin again? Have you overcome that? Have you repented? Have you asked God for forgiveness? That's what was to be expected out of you. You're still human even though you've been born again. But have you done the right thing about it? That's great. Have you grown closer to God since your baptism? If these are the things that you're worried about when you're thinking back about on the first time you went to the water, I would just say that you've grown. And that's a really, really good thing. Hebrews 6, 1, 2 The writer here commands these people to grow. He says, therefore, leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrines of baptisms, of the laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, of eternal judgment. He says, it's time for you to grow, right? It's time for you to have a better understanding of these things. This is exactly what we've been commanded to do. As well, in 2 Thessalonians 1, 
says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because of your faith grows exceedingly, and your love of every one of you all abounds towards each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all of your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Here you have two grow words. You obviously have because your faith grows exceedingly, and then you have your love of everyone, and all of you abounds, right? Two things that are growing here. I think it gives two reasons why these things are growing. It's the end there. It says that because of your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Often when we realize we've grown a lot since our baptism is usually after a tribulation because we grow really fast in those moments. And we look back and go, wow, I'm, I'm not the person I used to be. And instead of maybe immediately thinking, oh, I need to go to the water again, maybe before that we should go to what Paul goes here. He starts this line with, we are bound to thank God always for you. If you look back when you were baptized and you think, wow, I understand so much more. I I appreciate my salvation more. I appreciate God more. I love God more. Instead of thinking, I need to go back to the water again because now I know more, I'd rather us first go, wow, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God, because he is teaching me and helping me grow in faith and in love. Thanks be to God. I think that might be a first step. But however, we still have ways. We still have the Bible. We still can ask, okay, was I baptized with faith? Was I baptized with conviction? Was I baptized with repentance? Was I baptized like the pattern? That's still a fair question to ask ourselves sometimes if we're thinking about that. But if we see that we've grown, let's just thanks be to God. To date, of all the people I've had that conversation with, Only one, I didn't talk her out of it, but only one decided after having this conversation, you know what, I've grown. I just understand more. And it's more important to me, and that's why I was thinking I might need to go to the water again. But when I was first baptized, I did it with faith. I did it with conviction. I did it with repentance. I think I'm okay. I think what I need to do is focus on being thankful to God and growing. But having said all that, I'm going to say it again. If you want to be baptized, in the name of Jesus, I will baptize you right now. We'll do it, all right? There's no hindrance here. Even if you've been to the water before and you're thinking, you know what, Andrew, I just didn't have faith then. I didn't really believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Or, Andrew, I didn't do it for real. I was not convicted of my sin. Andrew, I never dedicated my life to God through repentance. I didn't turn to him, even from those little things, even from those big things. I didn't do any of that. Maybe I didn't do it according to the pattern. If you feel that way, let's make it right, right now, right? Let's do it for real this time. If you'll please come forward as we stand and as we sing. Don't